Good morning. Today I'll be reading Luke 8, verses 21 to 27. And it says, He replied, My mother and brothers are the ones who hear God's word and put it into practice. Only one day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over the other side of the lake. So, that, so they got into the boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake. So the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are going to drown. He got up and rebuked. The wind and the raging waters, the storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith, he said, asking his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked, the one, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. They sailed to the region of the Gerashians, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Thank you, Zach. So if you see this coming at you, are you single-minded? <laughs> he looks pretty single-minded too, doesn't he? <laughs> We're glad to have all of you here this week. It's going to be a great time and just being able to worship God today. But there's some great things going on around us. I know we've got people out of town, but we've also got some visitors here. So that's really a great thing to be able to see. I've seen, I think, three or four different people from all different parts of the world. So that's always an exciting thing in, in Mesa when we get that many people coming together. Uh, mission team will be back. Uh, lots of exciting things that have gone on there. So that's, that's really, really great. So Jesus seems to have had a whole lot of distractions from storms to demon-possessed men to all kinds of different things that, that, you know, he just had to deal with all the time. And that's one of our hardest things in being single-minded is being able to, to have no distractions whatsoever. I don't know how you are about being single-minded or, or focusing on one thing. But I think that's an important thing for us to be able to have. And so as you look at Christian life and what it really means for us, I think that's something important for us to be able to do. So in that idea of thinking about having only one thing, you, did you realize this is the year for the Olympics? Nobody realized this is the year for the Olympics. Well, they're coming, and so they are August 5th through 21st in Rio de Janeiro, and so I thought maybe we could go. What do you think? I mean, Kevin, he looks pretty good. Do you want to enter? Tell you what, I'll run the 100-yard dash if you'll run the marathon. Does that sound all right? I'm sure you could do it. I have every confidence in you. What's wrong with this picture? It might take a little bit more training than that. For me, I don't mean for Kevin. He could probably do the marathon, but for me to get the 100 yards, I, I mean, that would be difficult, wouldn't it? Do you need to do something ahead of time? You probably need a little preparation, a little bit of planning, and the guy who actually wins the gold is going to have spent a lifetime working toward that one thing. His diet changed, his exercise changed, the people he know changes, where he lives changes, so that he is able to do one thing, and that's get a gold medal. And I think that's amazing to see people so focused I wish we had that kind of focus for Jesus, don't you? What an amazing thing to be able to see people who are able to take their life and be able to say, I see one thing that I want at the end, and be able to do that in such a way that they're able to win that prize. I think we see Paul doing that as we read his writings. I want to see Mesa do that. And all of us be able to do that as well as you think about this whole thing. Now, if you're going to be able to do this, it's going to take a whole lot of preparation. I think we see Jesus doing this as well. If you look at Luke chapter 9, verse 21, 
It says, And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus had just asked them about his identity, and Peter has confessed, we believe you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And so then he begins to tell them about this other part. I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I will be killed, I'm going to be rejected by the chief priests and elders and the scribes, and I will be raised on the third day. And he says this over and over and over again to his disciples, because it is his one thing. It's what he's trying to do. It's the one focus of all of his life. Now that involves a whole lot more than just, you know, having somebody kill you. Um, that might not be that hard during that day and time. All you have to do is make somebody really mad and they carry swords and spears and all kinds of weapons like that. Not what Jesus wants. He's going to a cross on purpose so that we might have salvation. And so in order to do that, he's got to be able to teach people about his cross and what that really means. He's got to be able to train disciples who are going to carry on after that. He's got to be able to give some way for people to be able to believe. And so he does miracles so that people are then able to believe. He's got to confront the religious leaders of the day because they are completely distorting what God wanted. And he's trying to bring in a new covenant, a new way. And he needs to show them that this is the fulfillment of everything that they know already. There's a lot of work to be done with this. It's not just a matter of saying, I'm going to a cross. That might be simple enough, but it is the equivalent of getting the gold medal, if not more, because all of his life then becomes focused on that one thing. I'm going to a cross, and it colors everything else in his world. That's where I'm going. I'm going to this cross, and that's where I will be part of all of those things. And you see, then he invited us to be part of his one thing. It's his one thing, and then he invites us to be part of his one thing. He has gone to this cross. He has been there. He is the one who is able to say this. As you look at Luke chapter 9, the, he's talking and training and trying to get his disciples to understand all about this. And so he said to all, not just disciples, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And so Jesus says, I want you to focus on that one thing as well. If you would follow after me, I want you to be able to deny yourself. So it's no longer about you. You're no longer the most important. In fact, you're not even in the picture at all. I want you to deny yourself, not for no reason at all, just because we don't like you know, proud people, but deny yourself in order to get somewhere, in order to be able to take up your cross. You don't have to do it in order to attend church. You don't have to do it in order to do a lot of things, but that's what he's trying to say here, is so that you can now take up your cross, and then he adds daily. Daily? Jesus only had to do this once, and now we're daily? Yeah, because that's what he's trying to describe here, is this whole, if you would take my view, my one thing, because we have that cross as well. It's a, a point of suffering where we might follow God. It's a place where other people would do things to us. It's, it's a point at which we know we would die. It's also a point at which we see Jesus. And his one thing becomes our one thing. As he went to a cross, so would we. So would we follow God wherever God leads us and wherever God wants us to be. And then that's what he says next is, I want you to follow me. I want you to listen to my teaching. I want you to understand what this is all about. 
And so as they're looking at this whole thing, he says, I want you to walk with me every single day to learn what I mean, to know what I mean, to be able to understand what I'm trying to teach, to be able to live like I live, to be able to have the same attitude that I have. And so you see him being able to do that with his disciples, but that doesn't come just all of a sudden. You see, they're always still arguing about who's the greatest. I think I have a gold medal. I think my gold medal is better than your gold medal. I'm going to be better at this. And that's, they're completely missing the point. So he's got to teach them and train them and get them to learn what it means to be able to really follow Jesus. It does mean give up yourself, take up his one purpose, that cross, and then be able to follow him. And he gives you the logic of it all. Whoever would save his life will lose it. I mean, you can do a great job in business and, and get everything that you need and have a great big house and, and everything all set up. And then the worst part is you get old, right? And then you're going to die anyway. And then what good does it do you? And that's exactly the argument Jesus makes here is, why don't you make it about something that's better, something that's more permanent, not something that just fades away? And he says, I'm going to treat you like you treat me. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. But if you're proud of me and if you take my teaching and follow my teaching, then I'll confess you. He says, some people are going to get it. Some people are going to see that kingdom come. And he talks about the time when they will really understand the reign of God as the reign of God comes into their world. As Peter's able to preach on Pentecost and he opens it up to every single person in the whole world. All of us Gentiles who didn't have that opportunity before are now able to have this opportunity with the kingdom of God. And Jesus brings it in through his cross. Make sense so far? I know sometimes the picture is a little bit difficult. Let me give you another one. If you think about, and, and God gives us different ones all the way through. So if you think about Noah and his ark, God says to Noah, you're going to have one purpose. I want you to build an ark. What's the reason? Well, there's a flood coming. Everybody's going to die that's not in the ark. Okay, good reason. I think I'll build an ark. But that's not so simple, is it? It's not just a matter of saying, okay, well, we'll do it next weekend. No, somebody's got to be able to do this. And uh, oddly enough, or maybe God planned enough, he's got three sons. And this may have taken a whole bunch more people, but as you look at this whole thing, they're going to build this ark. It's a family project. It's not just Noah and well, we'll see you later, Dad. We're going fishing and leaving Dad with the whole thing. And, well, I guess God called me to do this. He didn't really call them. No. If God called the Father, he called the children. We've got to get that. This is a family project. It's not just him. And it's his wife. And it's his son's wives. And it's going to be all their kids because this is a hundred year project that's going to take a lot out of their time and out of their family and out of everything else. But don't you think it was worth it? Because the flood wipes out everybody. But you look at the task and it's kind of staggering. This says there's a million four hundred thousand cubic feet, 14,000 tons if you ever built a house, you know somebody's got to carry every single board up there. Somebody carried 14,000 tons of lumber. And who's going to make the nails? I mean, they did have bronze back then. We do see that. Or did they use pegs? Can you make enough bronze? Do you have to have bronze? Can you be able to get a nail that would drive into a board that's that big just to be able to make an ark that would hold elephants? and rhinoceros and all of those other animals that seem really really huge and how do you feed those guys anyway and we got to have enough food for a year and then we got to know how to train them and we got to be able to use that and it's just kind of staggering isn't it 
that makes one single purpose. If it's ever going to happen, your life is going to be dedicated to that. And I think we see God doing that a number of times with different people all the way through. He wants David to be king. That's not an easy process. But you see David going through whatever it takes in order to be king. He wants Moses to lead the people to a new land. You see him being able to go through a huge process of whatever that takes. Now we kind of get things a little bit mixed up when we do this with our life. Um, a person will, and I see this on TV, they'll buy a house, but they're buying a house that will fit with their dog. Right? You ever seen that? I can't accept this house because my dog wouldn't like it. Really? It's got to have a big yard. You know, it's got to be a place where my dog would like. It's got to have a dog bathtub. <laughs> you know, all those things. We're going to focus our life on, well, you know, our dog really has to be able to live here. And the car I'm going to buy has got to be dog friendly, right? Because it's all got to be focused on that one thing. It's all about him. And you know, if we make the focus too small, it becomes either a or it shows us selfish and it's really a focus about us. And so there are a lot of misconceptions, I think, that we have about different things. What's the one thing you would pick? Maybe there's thousands of things. Sometimes we want to focus on love. I'm just going to focus on love. I'm going to love one another. Isn't that a great idea? I mean, wouldn't that be important? After all, it's a command. Love one another. It's a great thing. Be able to love each other. There's not really an end to it. God wants us to love. But in the end, you kind of get selfish about it. Yes, I'm the person who's loving. And that's what I do because it's about me being I just don't think it's big enough. It might be part of something else, but it's not big enough just to say, well, I'm just going to be a loving person. I'll love everybody regardless of everything that they do no matter what. Certainly a good part, but I think it's part of something much bigger. Or we make it about family. It's all going to be about my family and about taking care of my family and about protecting my family and about making them the center of everything. So it's all about my family and I'm just going to do that one thing and make it not about anybody else. And we become selfish about our family. Now that's good to have a family. That's not bad at all. But I think it may be part of something that's bigger when you really think about it all because it doesn't seem right that we would take our family and pull them in to we're not going to let them outside do you know what's outside we're going to watch, not going to watch tv do you know what they show on that thing we're not going to let them talk really to anybody else in the world because we're going to keep them safe hmm Seems like maybe if we learned another way to do that, family is part of a bigger process. So we'll pull passages like Joshua 24 where Joshua says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then he turned around and he went home and he never walked out of his house again. No. The time when he says that is just after he has conquered the land of Canaan. And he says, I want you to choose because I have conquered a land with God for my kids and their kids and their kids' kids to be able to live here. And so is it about family? Yes, it's about family. But it's about taking your family to do what God wants. It's not just that one little focus on, you know, I'm glad we had the kids we have because I don't want their kids you know how that goes. Well, sometimes I'm not sure I wanted mine either. But we can't be so tight on this whole thing that we get the wrong focus. So when you say one thing, make sure you get the right one thing. Because, yeah, we could focus on one thing and it not really not have any importance at all. I was doing a Bible study one time when I saw a picture on the guy's fridge of a BMW which seemed odd because this guy, you know, I'm not sure he even had a car yet. 
and certainly the place where we were sitting was not something that looked like a person who would drive a BMW. And so I asked him about what's that. He says, that's my one thing. And he had been taught through some of the positive mental attitude type people that, you know, if you want one thing, you can get it. And you just have to focus on it. You have to go for it. And then I learned he was selling, I don't know, vitamins or Tupperware or some kind of pyramid scheme things. And I said, okay, now I understand. I'm sure he would get it because that is true. Whatever you focus on, you will be able to get you will be able to do. That is not necessarily a Christian principle. It is something that can be used that way, and maybe it started with God, but you can focus on something that's sinful, and you can get it. You can focus on anything, and you will be able to accomplish it. And our real question today is, what is it that's worth your focus? Jesus' focus was a cross. And he invites us into his focus. And so I think a lot of that is what's very, very important for us to understand is a way in which we would go about doing that. If you want something so badly, I'm sure you will be able to get it. Some people are better at it because they can multitask. Some of us are just stuck with only one channel. And, you know, when that channel goes off, it's, it's pretty hard. It's like, squirrel! I don't know if you're like that or not, but anyway, some of us have that addiction or affliction. So Jesus goes on as he's talking to his disciples, and he had invited them into his cross, and in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Yeah, I guess timing is important, and the time drew near, and that's what it means to set your face. You have only one focus. So he's no longer distracted by anybody else. He's no longer trying to do anything else. He's no longer healing anybody else. He's no longer teaching anybody else. He is going to Jerusalem to a cross. And you'd be surprised how many friends you lose that way. Because nobody wants him anymore. The Samaritans, well, you know, if you're going to do miracles, you could stay. Nope, no miracles. I'm just, I just need a place to sleep tonight. Well, then, no. James and John get kind of mad and said, we'll burn them up. Not the right attitude either. You know, there's got to be something different there. It's not a matter of destroying everybody who would get in your way. It's a matter of, you know what, you got to figure a way around them and keep going to your one focus. And so that's what we see him doing, going to Jerusalem. And he's going to build a sacrifice for all the people. And as he builds this sacrifice, it involves the teaching, the healing, the, the patience, the personal touch when he's able to heal people and fig trees and sycamore trees and the people who are up in them and sinners and Pharisees and arguments and miracles and proofs and preaching and logic and prayer and a garden and a cross and a tomb. All of that is part of one thing. It's the thing he does to build redemption. And he's building grace for all men because of his life, his death mattered. And the way you live is what will make your death matter. Jesus was intent on finishing, and so as he gets to the end and is actually hanging on the cross, one of his last statements is it's finished. What does he mean? All of it. I've gotten to the cross, and it's finished. He's reached his goal. What an incredible thing it is to have lived a life where we're just able to say that rather than trying to hang on for a last minute because we're not done yet. And Jesus says, I know I was done. 
He goes on from this passage in the next to say, as they were walking along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests and the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. As for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And so Jesus deals with excuses of his disciples at this time. One had actually come to him and said, I will follow you. It's a declaration. And Jesus says, I don't have any security. You realize nothing's permanent. You realize I don't have a place where I stay. Even birds make nests and I, the only place I belong is on a cross. That's where I'm going. You want that? We're not told whether he accepted or not. Foxes have holes and the Son of Man is going to a cross. That's the only place I belong. And he called another one to follow me. And then he has this strange thing about let me bury my father. I would think that would be okay, wouldn't you? It would seem like a good thing to be able to do that. And after all, maybe a day or two. And, but I don't think it's a day or two as you read the passage and try and put it together and what we understand about Jesus because I don't think the father's even died. The father may not even be close to death. And he's really talking more about a stage of life. First, let me get my parents past where my parents are. And then once I've got that stage of life cleared out, well, then I'll be able to follow you. And he says, no, you better let people who are concerned about that just deal with that themselves. And he called another one to follow him. And he says, you know, that's important. Let me say goodbye to those at home. And certainly home is important. But he says, you can't look back. You can't always be looking back for what's always behind you and wishing you were back there. And Well, I have to suffer following the cross. It's terrible and I hate it, but all right, God, I'll follow you. He says, that's not the way it is. It needs to become your one focus. And you bring your family with you. As you look at what happens in families today, that's what makes all the difference. The parents who have brought kids with them, train them, is what makes all the difference. Been there as part of them. Now, nothing guarantees that. But they're our first disciples, aren't they? They're our first evangelism, right? And we start discipling them, not looking back. What if God sends you out on a mission field? What if God sends you to Thailand? I mean, crazy place. I think they eat bugs over there. Would you be looking for home? We have a missionary who's crazy enough to come back and eat Thai food. I mean... <laughs> He's, he's gotten so much into that that it's who he is. And I think that's what Jesus is telling us here. There are times when we put God first. We put God first in everything. Now that involves a whole lot. That involves your family. That involves your job because I want you to live like Christ on your job. That involves your conversation with your friends because I want you to live like Christ in that conversation. He's not trying to take you away from everything. He's trying to say, take your life and focus it on one thing so that it colors all of your life and that all of your life becomes that way. The disciples had to deal with a lot of issues, and I think we have to as well. You see, as Jesus calls people, he says, I want you to decide. I want you to know this is what's right for you. And there are times when we have to decide this is the one thing. When Peter preaches on Pentecost about that kingdom that's opened up, he says it's repentance and baptism. That's a first step. This is, I will follow you, Jesus. It's a death to ourselves. It's an acceptance of Jesus. It's being able to live like him where we deny ourselves. We take up our cross daily. 
And their life wasn't over. Their life was just beginning. And how full it is that God was able to do such powerful things in their life. Is now they took their families, and they took their friends, and they took their jobs, and they were able to see what God was able to do in such a powerful way. Can we live like that today? Maybe it's time for you to respond to that. Because, yeah, he calls you. Will you follow me? Deny yourself, take up your cross. Whatever we can do to help you in that, that's what we want to do. Would you come while we stand and sing?